This is 99 Novels, a podcast by the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. In 1984, the writer Anthony Burgess selected his 99 favourite novels in English since the outbreak of the Second World War. Never short of an opinion about books, Burgess's list is typically idiosyncratic and invites closer attention, so we've invited some of the leading scholars, critics and writers to tell us more about each of the 99 novels. So read along with us as we explore a reading list created by one of the most original literary voices of the 20th century. In this episode we're exploring one of the most famous books on Burgess's list, as writer and academic John Bowen takes us through 1984 by George Orwell. Published in 1949, 1984 is one of the most revered pieces of dystopian fiction ever written. Telling the story of Winston Smith, an office drone who rewrites established history for the Ministry of Truth, Orwell's novel creates a terrifying vision of a totalitarian Britain. As Winston begins to rebel against the authoritarian Big Brother by writing criticisms of the political establishment in his diary, he falls in love with the mysterious Julia and is befriended by O'Brien, who may be a spy for the resistance. George Orwell was born Eric Blair in 1903 in India. He's renowned for his political writing in the non-fiction books The Road to Wigan Pier, Down and Out in Paris and London, and Homage to Catalonia. His novels include Animal Farm, Burmese Days, The Clergyman's Daughter, and Keep the Aspidistra Flying. 1984 was his final novel, and he died in 1950. John Bowen is Professor of 19th Century Literature at the University of York. His main research areas are in 19th and 20th century fiction, in particular the works of Charles Dickens and other major Victorian novelists. He's the author of Other Dickens, Pickwick to Chuzzlewit, and has edited Anthony Trollope's Barchester Towers and Phineas Redux for Oxford World's Classics. He's contributed to a number of television documentaries and radio programmes, including BBC Radio 4's In Our Time, Front Row, Open Book, Beyond Belief, Today and Women's Hour, Channel 4's Dickens' Secret Lover and BBC 2's Being the Brontes. His edition of George Orwell's 1984 was published by Oxford World's Classics in 2021. Check out the description of this episode for all the relevant links and a list of all the books mentioned. Here's Andrew Biswell of the Burgess Foundation, who spoke to John Bowen in August 2022. It's a great pleasure to welcome John Bowen to the 99 Novels podcast to talk about Orwell, to talk about 1984, and in particular, uh, John's edition of 1984 for Oxford World's Classics. Um, Welcome, John. I wonder if, first of all, you could tell us how you first encountered 1984, and indeed what you made of it the first time you read it. Uh, Well, (laughs) it was a long time ago. I was at school. Um, and so this must have been like the mid seventies. So it's like before nineteen eighty four, as a year. Um, and of course, the moment the year happens, uh, everything's different. Because, so then, I think probably it was mainly framed. So I must have read it at school, and I think I must have really been interested in it. I remember I read quite a lot of Orwell then. I read Animal Farm and quite a lot of the political writings. Um, I even went on to read. Arthur Kirsten's Darkness at Noon, I think. So that, I must, it must have kind of got under my skin. Because then, you know, it's such a different political climate. And, and often I think the question was framed as, uh, okay, does all get it right? Will 1984 be like that? And of course, in lots of ways, we knew it wasn't going to be like that because uh, so many things had changed in the post-war years, the post-war welfare state and the economic boom across Europe. I mean, although still there was the presence of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc and, you know, fascist states in Spain in the early 70s and Portugal and Greece. So there was a sense that the the totalitarianism was a very real um, force there. Um, So I think it was was framed quite strongly in political terms and always the side of Orwell 
that was a socialist interested me. But I didn't ever read it in quite the Cold War ways that I think perhaps we were being encouraged to. Um, so that, that was that was my sense of it. I, I, I've always found the last third of the book, I still do now, really difficult. You know, it's basically, um, you know, 150-odd pages of torture. And um, it's a tough read. And I think I found it a tough read then. And like most people, I find the first the first book and probably the second um, the most interesting. I mean, recently, when I reread it for the to write the introduction to the Oxford, it was during COVID. And, you know, my one bit of advice is, if you're in the middle of a global pandemic, don't spend a lot of time reading a book about torture. It was because it was so miserable, you know. Uh, and, of course, if you're editing the damn thing, you have to um, read it over and over again really carefully. Um, and I never want to go back to Room 101 with O'Brien ever again. It's very interesting you mention Arthur Kersler and Darkness at Noon, partly because uh, he's hugely influential on Anthony Burgess. Uh, Burgess knew Kersler and um, read his Danube edition of his works and interviewed him um, for BBC Radio when that came out. Um, very interesting um, lines of continuity, I think, between between Kersler and Orwell, who I don't know if they knew each other. They certainly knew of each other's work. Yes, I think they they, they have a friendship, I think, in the 40s. Um, uh, and I think Orwell learns from Darkness at Noon. So, so yeah, I think there, there is... Um, there is a personal relationship as well as the the obvious kind of literary affiliations between the between the two books. Well, 1984, as we know, it's the last of Orwell's novels, written in very difficult circumstances when his health was already beginning to fail. I wonder, could you tell us something about the genesis of the book? For example, how it was written and where it was written. So Orwell writes Animal Farm during the war, and then there's a, he has a problem getting it published. Eventually, it does come out. Uh, he's also then working for the BBC during the war and um, also doing quite a lot of journalism for the Tribune. The very first thing we know for sure as the genesis of the book is from 1943, where he thinks about a, a writer and then two characters. I think he calls them X and Y. So right at the start, there's a triangular relationship between two men and a woman. Um, those are the very first notes. And then in '45, I think, uh, just after the war, then his publisher records that he's written the first 12 pages. Now, the book doesn't come out till '49, um, and Orwell writes it sort of in stages, interrupted quite seriously by his ill health. So he's got tuberculosis um, in a pretty bad form. He may have got it in Spain, he may have got it during his tramping years, we're not sure. Um, and uh, he, in order to get away from London, he's offered a cottage on the Isle of Jura in Scotland. And there he finds a remote, deserted farmhouse that's not been lived in for 12 years. And he kind of falls in love with it. It's the end of, this, end of a very long track um, that can, you can barely get a car down. So not the place you'd naturally think someone in his state of health would want to live in. You know, they're tough winters up there. But he spends a great deal of time on Jura and you read his diary and there's very little, very little about politics. Like the, the wartime diary when he's living in London is a lot about politics. The one up there is all about, you know, the hens laid three eggs today. I've got to dig this patch. We caught so many fish today. Oh, God, the boats come unanchored. So he absolutely throws himself into um trying to turn this wreck of a farmhouse and uh, uh, into a, a place where he can live and work. And that's really where most of the writing gets done. And it's not good for his health um, because uh, he has, there's paraffin lamps, which are smoky. He's smoking himself a lot. So none of these are good for his lungs. And he then has to reach, because he can't get a typist up there because it's so remote, he then has to retype the whole thing personally. Um, so none of this is doing his health any good at all. At one, you know, he's always taking his boat out. At one stage, they all nearly drown because he gets caught in the famous whirlpool, uh, the Corrie Vrecken that's up there. Um, so um, it, it's very much, I think, a Isle of Jura book. Um, that's where he retreats to write. Um, and it works. He, he finishes the book, but at the same time also at a great cost to his health. 
reading 1984 alongside some of Orwell's other fiction, his earlier fiction, how do you think it compares with these other novels, such as Burmese Days, Coming Up for Air, uh, Clergyman's Daughter, which I've always been very fond of, though, though few other people are? Yeah, I mean, well, in one way, I think Orwell's kind of got one plot. And the plot is this, right? Somebody is um, miserable. They're somewhere between their late 20s and early 40s. They feel their life is wasted and futile, um, and they're stuck in some way. The, the people around them are pretty repellent. The food they eat is pretty disgusting. They've never got enough money, and they try and break free from it. Now, that's true about a clergyman's daughter. It's true about coming up for air. You know, it's true about keep the aspidistra flying. And they all try to break out of this grim, dull, unintellectual, physically loathsome, usually very smelly world that they're kind of caught in, they're trapped in. They all try and get away from it. The clergyman's daughter, you know, there she um, does all the things that Orwell does. She kind of walks out, losing her memory, and then she does goes hot picking. She tramps around. But in the end, she returns to the grim life that she began with. And in a way, that's a bit like 1984 too. You know, 1984, he's in middle life. He feels he's messed his life up. He's stuck in a, you know, tedious, just about, you know, okay job. Hasn't got enough money. Food is awful. Everything smells. The people he works with are repellent. And he tries to burst out of that with the romance with Julia. But then, of course, you know, he gets his comeuppance and... Uh, is captured and uh, busted. So, so in a way, you know, the settings are so different. But And, of course, the politics is much more explicit in 1984 than in those earlier books. But the fundamental plot uh, or the kind of stance, the, the character and this attempt to break free and the failure is is absolutely, you know, continuous, I think, through, through almost all his fiction. It's very interesting, Burgess, in 99 novels, he makes two big claims about 1984. First of all, he says it's a comic novel, comic in the sense of yoking together a kind of documentary account of shortages and gloom in the post-war era and the idea, the impossible notion, he says, of British intellectuals taking over the government of the country. Uh, And the other thing he says, it's not a perfect novel um, on the basis that... He says it's too didactic to be considered a novel at all. Uh, interestingly, he says the same thing about A Clockwork Orange later on. Um, but I, I wonder how fair uh, any of that commentary is, what, what you think of the notion of the comic novel, but also the, the novel that's sort of too didactic and is kind of um, uh, unbalanced or overbalanced by that. Yeah, I mean, there is a kind of grim brio about 1984. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah... The, Uh, There are some, you know, the bits where, you know, they're doing the physical jerks in the morning and Winston hasn't touched his toes in several years and this, uh, he's being harangued from the TV screen to do so. Um, Or, you know, he has to invent at one point um, Comrade Ogilvy, who is the kind of the, a bit like Stakhanov in the Soviet Union, the kind of perfect moral worker. So in order to, when as part of his job rewriting um, newspapers um, he, he thinks the easiest way to to cover up this story he's got to get rid of is just to invent a completely fictitious person being given an award and that's a very nice comic, comic satire of the Soviet Union and, and funny and also there's bits like where Julia falls asleep um, when he's reading out so he gets this you know, this document that will reveal the truth about the society and he's makes great uh, sacrifices to get it and starts to read it out to Julia, who then promptly falls asleep. So th- there is that. I wouldn't generally think of it as a, a comic novel, I don't think. I mean, it, it is... Uh, I mean, I see it as, as much more like a gothic. It's a gothic novel. It, those are the emotions, terror and horror, the gothic, great gothic emotions that it deals in. Um, but there is, you know, a kind of teeth-clenched, um, <laughs> grim wartime kind of humour to it, as there always is with, with Orwell, and a kind of relish for disgust. I think that, that that's true. Um, whether it's a failure, I mean, I, it's hard, I think. You know, novels, in a way, are such a... The novel as a form is so capacious um, that it's very hard to say something isn't a novel 
because almost anything, almost anything can be in a novel. You know, it's not like you can say something isn't a pastoral poem or isn't an epic uh, because there are clear generic um, needs and requirements for those. But I, the novel, I think, is pretty elastic in what it can conclude. Also, I mean, I'm not so sure it is that didactic uh, in that so much. So the whole novel we get, not through Orwell, but through the consciousness uh, of Winston Smith. Now, Winston, if you think very early on, almost the first thing we learn about him, he's got this notebook and he's writing down what he's seen. And what he has seen is at the pictures, um, some Jewish refugees in a boat. So that seems very resonant now, refugees in a boat being bombed from the air. And he says it was a beautiful camera shot. And he then gets annoyed with the audience, but he seems to not register their suffering at all. He's kind of anaesthetized to it, and he aestheticizes it, the beautiful camera shot. Um, and so it's not that we're getting a view of this society through someone teaching us a lesson, but through someone whose whole consciousness is kind of permeated, pierced by the norms of this very strange society. And he's got a sense that it's not right, but it's not that he's somehow some noble figure who's radically different from it. He's, he's, his whole unconscious almost at that point, the, the thing he most wants to say is, you know, isn't admirable, isn't heroic. It's completely compromised by, by the, the society he's in. And, and he's like that in the two minutes hate as well. Um, he feels it powerfully drawing him in, in which he feels these deep irrational emotions. So I, I, I don't see that Orwell is, um, as it were, being didactic. What he's interested in, and this seems to be the, the power of the book, he's interested in the way our desires, or male desires particularly, are manipulated, are, their vulnerabilities are used. Uh, to make them violent in certain ways or to be subordinate in certain ways. So that, that seems to me, um, as it were, the psychological interest or the psychological complexity or the novelistic kind of achievement of it. Um, so, so I don't think... Um, I mean, um, well, <laughs> I mean, one reason it, we might not think of it as didactic is that the lessons that people have drawn from it have been so very different. So some people draw very conservative lessons. You know, it's a moral tale about how bad the Soviet Union was. But Orwell himself, of course, uh, says everything he's been written has been fav in favour of democratic socialism. So, so, that, <laughs> so if, if it were a clearly didactic book, then I think there'd be much more consensus about what it is that it's teaching us. Um, but, but there are radical doubts, I think, about what that teaching is. So just to take another example, at the very end of the book, there's an account of Newspeak, and that's unintegrated into the story. But the position from which it's told sounds like it's from a society um, well beyond and utterly different from the society that we see in 1984. So um, Margaret Atwood has, has, is claiming that that shows that it won't last forever, the world of Big Brother. Uh, and this perpetual kind of stasis of war between these three states, because where else could this have come from but from a society that had gone beyond it? Um, now, one doesn't have to buy into the whole optimistic reading of that, but it also um, disturbs, I think, any simple sense that this is a didactic novel, because it's very unclear at that point what it is we're supposed to infer about the relationship between that appendix and the main body of the text. So, so, I, think, so I think Burgess is kind of interesting. He's provocative as, as always. He's, I'm glad he points out bits of comedy because they're, they're, they're there and they're often uh, ignored by rather po-faced commentators. But, but didactic, I probably would push back against, I think. You make the argument in your introduction that there are very prominent um, examples in the novel of, uh, of Gothic writing, which 
I think haven't often been noticed or, or, or connected uh, by other people who've uh, who've written about it and commented on it. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about where you find them and and how those examples of uh, you know sort of dreams and the the elements of gothic build to make the novel as you've argued anti-realistic yeah okay i wouldn't necessarily say it's anti-realistic um so 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 one way of thinking about the gothic is it's as it were not not realist but it may be that 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 there are ways in which it got affiliations to both but let me do the gothic stuff first okay so winston thinks of himself as being like a ghost like already dead and the monster so those are things that he he you know that's that's how he thinks of himself um there's lots of very odd strange um powers in the book so if you think so the the emotions of the book terror horror these are the gothic emotions the sense or feeling of being trapped of not having choices of things already being decided beforehand so in his relationship with O'Brien, so O'Brien is the, the torturer. Um, it seems to be that they've got, it seems from the novel that they've got a telepathic relationship. Uh, so that, that um, Winston dreams seven years before he's being tortured by O'Brien of that torturing. And also O'Brien knows that he's had that dream. He says, oh, you remember in your dreams when you had that. The either thought is that he's got a telepathic relationship with him or that he somehow implanted that in his head. So this is all very strange, and on the whole doesn't get, get talked about very much. So free will is weak in it. There's these strange anticipations, recurrences, prophecies. There's a constant threat of surveillance. People are come, separated off from something very important to them, like the past and their family. They feel like they're a living corpse, Winston does. Um, sexuality in Gothic is kind of repressed and perverse. Spaces are dark and frightening or solitary and then suddenly burst in on. The self is kind of besieged by threats to its bodily integrity and freedom. Now, all those are true of Gothic fiction. And in spades, they're all true of, um, of 1984. And, you know, there isn't some Gothic castle, but there is the Ministry of Love, the most frightening place, this, which is guarded by lots of armed guards and has got cellars in which you're tortured. So, so this, I think, is, is where the whole colouring of the book um, looks Gothic and draws on the Gothic tradition, and that's where it gets lots of its power. And, of course, people often think of Gothic as not being a political, not being a political kind of form. It's an escapist form. But of course, Gothic arises, in, particularly strongly, in the late 18th century, around the time of the French Revolution, in which the terror, the political terror, is matched by the fictional terror. And, of course, it's also one of the prime ways that people explore perverse sexuality, and this is, characteristically, that's also true of 1984. Now, so that's the general Gothic colouring of the book, in a way. But there's a particular kind of Gothic called paranoid Gothic, which is usually where you get a triangular relationship between two men and a woman in which the affective or emotional or sexual relationship between the two men becomes much more powerful than the heteronormative or heterosexual one between the man and the woman. So if you think in um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, there's Frankenstein, the creator, and then the monster, and then, he, then Frankenstein's wife, Elizabeth. And the two male creatures, are, you know, Frankenstein and the monster, are bound together in this incredibly intense relationship of kind of loathing but, but linkage uh, and it ends or, or one key moment is where he says I'll be with you on your wedding night says the creature and kills Elizabeth so the woman dies through the through the this intense bond between the two men and, and there are many versions of that in other fictions like Dickens Mystery of Edwin Drood for example and that in some ways is quite similar to O'Brien's intense relationship with with Winston so the first time Winston sees him he doesn't know if he he finds him very handsome he just wants to have a relationship with him he doesn't he doesn't care really whether he he'll sacrifice himself in this but he just wants to have an intense relationship with O'Brien 
And one of the key moments in the torturing scenes is where he says, do it, do it to Julia. He betrays his heterosexual romance to the passionate relationship with the other man. So it, it's a particular form, I think, as paranoid gothic, in which men in this period, so the 19th and 20th centuries, explore um, their own same-sex desires. Um, so Orwell is someone who's forced into kind of male, homosocial, we can call them, bonds, relationships, you know, uh, Eton, all men, all boys, you know, in the Burma police, all boys, this very male world, which constantly incites desire between men and also prohibits it. So Orwell is both deeply homophobic, you know, he's always criticising the Nancy poets, and at the same time, he's also clearly attracted to men. Um, and often he, you know, for example, there's two children early on who are horrible. And Winston notices how handsome the boy is. It doesn't mention the doesn't mention the girl. So it's both a, it, it's fascinated by same sex desire and the attractiveness of other men. He finds O'Brien physically very attractive. At the same time, he's deeply phobic, um, and that generates, I think, this kind of strange paranoid gothic. And if you said to me what the most distinctive thing about this book is, it's the way that it thinks about political desire. And some people see it as a book about politics. Um, but if you think of it as a novel that wants to explore, from a literary point of view, um, politics, it's interested in the way that our desires are mobilised in politics. Why is it? You know, what is it that leads to the two minutes hate or our aesthetic pleasure when we see um, someone being, a, a boatload of refugees being bombed? These are the really disturbing questions that, that Orwell's puzzling about. And it's about, particularly about male desire um, within male political desire, I think, um, which is so disturbing, both in its big manifestations, you know, it ends with him saying he loved Big Brother, so he loves another man. Um, so it's, it's at that level, but also on the day-to-day, -day, or also the much more intimate level of the kind of torture that Winston has to suffer uh, in the last third of the book. So that's, that's why I think it's a gothic. It's both gothic in its emotions and lots of its um, fictional qualities, and particularly its paranoid gothic qualities about these relationships between men full of desire and phobia that, that really leave some really interesting insights, I think, about the nature of, of the way that people get desires that they, that they think of as political or can be manipulated by them. It's a compelling argument, and one that, that you substantiate with, um, uh, you know, very persuasively. Lots of evidence where you say that it is at heart a love story. Um, I'm also very interested in the connections with Orwell's political journalism. I've been reading your edition in tandem with Stefan Collini's selected essays in the same Oxford series, um, and I wonder how far you think 1984 was shaped also by Orwell's experience of the Spanish Civil War, and indeed the Second World War. Yes, of course. I mean, you know, he's someone who is a socialist, but, but Spain, I think, teaches him, he's already sceptical about Stalinist Russia. And the fact that, you know, he, we now know he nearly lost his life because he was, you know, volunteered with a essentially Trotskyist uh, grouping. He was seen as a political enemy, and you could, the, uh, the Communist Party, in Spain was, you know, determined to be hegemonic in the, in the struggle against, against Franco, uh, and all himself narrowly escapes with his life. So that's very deep in, in him. You also see, I mean, the war, I think, both the kind of, the whole landscape of the book looks very post-war, you know, it, rationing and, you know, bombed out buildings and, um, you know, these uh, rocket bombs that come in that are very like V2s. So all is clearly drawing very deeply on just what it was like living during the during the, the war in London and also after the war when rationing, of course, continued and there were terrible food shortages and, um, and it was very cold and miserable. So he draws on all that misery uh, and, also, and also his deep, Political scepticism about 
about Stalinist Russia and wanting to try and think the possibility of, um, of a different kind of socialism. I mean, part of the strangeness, though, of 1984 is the fact that the dominant ideology of, um, as it were, the, the, of the airstrip one, which is where he's living, and Oceania, is called Ingsoc, which is short for English Socialism. Um, so, so all things, you know, he 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 both is. You see in his political writings, you know, passionately committed to English socialism, but also then, the degenerate version of that is also um, the leading kind of thought framework uh, for this absolutely hateful state. Um, so it is. I mean, it, it's really interesting reading his political journalism next to 1984. But I think what's distinctive about the novel is it's a literary investigation. So as it were, all well, probably in, you know, until that point, you kind of think the politics isn't deeply there in the fiction, you know, not in Closeman's Daughter, say, or, or coming up for air. There isn't, you don't, uh, there are two separate realms, as it were, that he's doing. And I think... Um, What's so striking about 1984 is it's both fully literary, right? It, it's kind of like his other novels, but it's also saturated with the, his his politics too, his political thinking in the journalism of the of the of the 40s in particular. I wonder if we can say something about the the literary roots of the novel. Um, I wonder how far does it emerge from Orwell's study of of the forms of utopia and dystopia, and how far is it a, an extension of the subject matter of Animal Farm? Yeah, I mean, so I won't say anything more about the Gothic, but that's clearly one thread <laughs> that feeds sure. into it. Um, there's also, also of course, Swift, I mean, he loves Swift, um, and the kind of satiric edge of the book, I think, you know, draws on that, that and he writes very well about Swift, draws on, on that tradition too. Um, there is a, a really interesting novel, um, by Zamyatin, uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin, called We, that all will take some trouble to find. It's not translated into English, I think, so he reads it in French translation, um, which has lots and lots of anticipations of 1984. So Zamyatin was a Bolshevik. He gets arrested um, under the Tsar, so he's an old Bolshevik. Uh, he, <laughs> he then is a, one of the earliest dissidents in the Soviet Union. And um, gets arrested again, and I think he's imprisoned in the same prison right, by, by by the communists. And so he writes a kind of dystopia in the future in which everybody is visible to each other all the time because they live in glass houses. And the character, again, a strange, mysterious sexual woman, takes him off, and um, and suddenly he break is broken from his kind of mindless conformity. Uh, so this, you see lots and lots of parallels there. And there is, in fact, a new translation came out a couple of years ago. The one I tried before was, was quite difficult to read, but the new translation is much better, and you, and you see how closely that links to Orwell. So Orwell is interested, is interested in um, utopia and dystopia. He's very interested in H.G. Wells. Um, they quarrel, actually, in the war, but they know each other, uh, and he's saturated in Wells, in early H.G. Wells. Um, also, he, of course, he knows uh, Brave New World um, and, and, and other writing. So it's, it's partly he's drawing on that tradition, I think, um, but then inflecting it all the time in quite distinctive ways, I think. Do you think Orwell is being too pessimistic when he presents this society, this future society, in which dissent has been almost entirely quashed and... Uh, the possibilities for resistance are so constrained because there's there's a whole class of people whose job it is to to carry out this this surveillance this constant surveillance of of almost everyone certainly of the the, the, the bourgeoisie as the novel presents it. Well, I mean, short answer is yeah. I mean, I think he he um, he does underestimate it. But I mean, having said that, um, you know, North Korea. I wonder what it's. We don't know about North Korea, and about dissent there, um, and it may be that we might not find out even in our lifetime. Um, but it will be interesting to see 
what, if any, dissent there is there. Um, or in Nazi Germany, um, particularly you know, during the war years, one would think internal dissent would be astonishingly difficult there. Um, but, the, but the more general point, I think, is that um, it's sustainable over a shortish period. But in the case of North Korea, that's a shortish period so far of 70 years. Um, but there are always internal, or ex- internal contradictions and, or external threats. So, as it were, if China pulled the plug on North Korea, it wouldn't last very long. Um, so, so it's vulnerable to external forces. Um, and that would be true. Nazi Germany is vulnerable to, to you know, the Soviet Union and uh, the United Kingdom and, the, and um, its allies and America destroying it. Uh, so there's always that um, vulnerability either or contradiction from within or from outside, I think. So he is too pessimistic. But uh, and I think the pessimism and the one of the weirdest bits of the book, and I think one of the things I'm least happy with or um, seems to me least successful is what are called the proles. So the, the thought we're supposed to have as we read the book is that 80% of the population aren't really regulated at all. They don't need to be. Working people, they kind of they they can easily be distracted with lotteries and beer, and um, that's about it really. And that's all they're interested in. They just talk about it and they've got and they don't care. Um, now, if you were looking truthfully at a society like 1984, you'd think, um, okay, 80% of the population, <laughs> there's no attempt to con- to or very little attempt to kind of um, control them. That's where resistance would come about. Now, in one way, the weird thing about the book is the, qu- the quote-unquote proles are highly valued by Winston. He says, you know, if there was hope, it came from the proles. On the other hand, every single encounter with them, he is phobic and he's disgusted you know, by, by their stupidity or their coarseness or their whatever it might be. So that seems to be very, very odd and unreali- <laughs> unrealistic, really, um, and seems to just stem from part of Orwell's own you know, class position and, um, in a way, inability to recognise the way that working people uh, organise themselves politically. So, you know, when he goes to, he writes the, the book that becomes Road to Wigan Pier, he, he goes to stay with trade unionists, you know, um, but they don't appear uh, in his book. So he, like, forms of political self-organisation by the working class, you know, all the extraordinary culture that built the trade union movement, you know, or in the uh, mining communities or in many, you know, in the mill towns of Lancashire, um, this very rich social and political culture, all in a way, or Eric Blair, seemed blind to it or willfully um, to ignore it. Um, and that, that's true as a general political point, I think, uh, about his writing, um, that there's a, there's a, what replaces it is a kind of disgust at the smelliness sometimes of working people. Um, but also that I think affects the political vision of 1984 and makes that bit implausible, really, I think. So the weakest scenes seem to me the one, for example, where he meets the old bloke in the pub and tries to, when Winston meets the old bloke in the pub and tries to get him to talk about what it was like in the old days. Um, it's like all their memories have been erased. Um, but they don't even have, but you can't see any mechanism by which that might have happened. Um, and they don't even have telly screens, as it were, the overwhelming majority of the population. So the surveillance is very selective by the small elite over what over the outer, the inner party, carry out this surveillance work over the um, outer party, the kind of people like Winston, while completely ignoring, for the most part, the overwhelming majority of the population. And that does seem to me a, a very odd way um, to, to, to think about social life. Um, and also, I think, one reason why um, 
of course he's too pessimistic <laughs> he's too pessimistic about about um, the lack of contradiction or the lack of resistance or dissent in that society but it's his novel <laughs> 1984 has been adapted for television and film. Uh, there's a stage play, there's a ballet. Most recently, there's a graphic novel by Fido Nesti. Uh, it's very interesting to us in relation to the, the various film and stage adaptations of A Clockwork Orange. Um, but how well do you think the important elements of 1984 have survived those translations and adaptations? Also, do you think anything gets lost along the way? I mean, there are notorious examples of where very serious major things are lost. So the, the film, there's a film in the 1950s, very much a Cold War film, which rewrites the ending. You know, so the ending is, is, is pessimistic and he says you know, he loves Big Brother uh, and it's rewritten in a kind of Cold War American idiom that he suddenly bursts out with a condemnation of Big Brother at the end. So it's a moment of heroic resistance to the brainwashing that, that he's been um, enduring. So that is, is, as it were, a travesty of the book. The ballet, I think, is is very interesting. Um, part of the problem, I think, with ballet, of course, is that the bodies you're watching are very beautiful ones. Um, they're dancers' bodies, and they're very expressive. And, of course, you know, the whole of Orwell's vision is about the pains of the body, you know. And um, Julia, Julia, you can dance. But Winston is much harder because, of course, he's got five false teeth and he's aging and he can't touch his toes in the book. Um, and so, so ballet is a, is a difficult form in that way. It can bring out some of the kind of choreographed um, regularity of social life in it. Um, but that sense of the acute vulnerability of the body, I think, um, is something that... that, that uh, Dancers just intrinsically, because of the nature of their body, or, or always rather um, self-hating relationship to the body, is, is hard to capture. Um, dramatizations, I mean, I think they they work. I think the what perhaps they lose is, you know, I talked earlier about the way that we first see, we kind of get into his head, into Winston's head, when he's filming his writing his diary. And you realise just how kind of tainted or corrupted he's been by the society he's in from that response to the, the bombing of the ship. And that, I think, is much harder to dramatise, those psychic processes. So everything, as it were, in the novel comes through Winston or through Winston's consciousness. And that, of course, because dramas necessarily externalise things, they want action rather than cause, um, that sense of the sheer strangeness of Winston um, and just how perverse his imagination is. You know, when he first sees Julia, he said he wants to flog her to death with a rubber truncheon. He wants to shoot her full of arrows like St. Sebastian. So that deeply perverse, erotic desire, well, it's fine, you can do it on the page. Um, that's much harder, I think, to dramatise. Um, so some of the, the darker, weirder stuff... Um, the strange things that happened to Winston's consciousness, the strange feelings, you know, the memories that he has of his mother, which seem to me so interesting, um, and that lead to an extraordinary bit late on where he's imprisoned um, and a drunken, disgusting woman comes in, asks him what his name is, and he says, Smith, and she says, I'm Smith, I might be your mother. And then she vomits all over him. And Winston thinks, oh, yeah, she might be he lost his mother earlier but never knew what happened to her so moments like that i think um the the haunted side of um winston the mother fixated one the one with strange memories and dreams um the perverse desires those i think are much harder to dramatize and the um uh, and, and as it were you, you get it much more powerfully in the book so it's, a, it's more disturbing i think the book um, than its adaptation. The other thing I wanted to ask you about in relation to Orwell was was Dickens. Knowing that you've published very widely on Dickens and also having read or Orwell's long essay um, expressing his enthusiasm for um, certain parts of the Dickens canon, especially Great Expectations, as I remember, um, I wonder 
whether you you find any um, elements of that uh, enthusiasm that he had for for Dickens translating either into this novel or any of his other fiction. Yeah, I mean, he I mean, it's a great essay, I think, on Dickens. The one, um, and he's obviously absolutely inward with it. He's got an amazing range of reference across the the body of the work. Um, he's a you know great literary critic, and one thing he was going to write. Uh, just before he dies, was a piece on um, evil in war. And I, I so regret that he never did that because I think it would have been very acute. Um, so, yeah, with Dickens, uh, I, don't think there's a, I don't think there's a lot in 1984 that you'd think of as Dickensian. Um, uh, wh- where I think one of the great claims that he makes in the essay I don't think he's quite right, is he says Dickens is basically a change of heart man. Right? So that, um, in a way, he's depoliticizing. He thinks in the end, you know, a bit like Scrooge. So Scrooge is the example. So Scrooge is miserable capitalist. And then he has a change of heart. Right? The spirits make him change his, change his you know, feelings and all is well. And Orwell generalises that across the whole canon of Dickens and says he's basically a change of heart man. He's not interested in structural change or political change. Um, he just thinks that somehow you'll make people um, kinder or nicer. I don't think that's true. I think Dickens is much more complex and subtle than that. Um, yeah, he borrows, in the earlier fiction, I think, like, um, he borrows names from Dickens. So Mrs. Creevy um, in... Is it in Clergyman's Daughter, I think? Um, you know, obviously there's Miss Lacreevy and Nicholas Nickleby. Um, part of the kind of comic grotesqueness that Orwell can do quite well um, is, I think, derives from Dickens, but it's probably inflected, I think, through George Gissing, who's a kind of also a great admirer of Dickens, but also more sort of um, gr- grim and miserable and disgusted, really. Um, I think, you know, Dickens loves popular life he loves it and he knows it and he celebrates it and he finds virtue in it um whereas i think orwell for all the class reasons that the the way he was you know from his his history finds that a much harder thing to do um there isn't that celebration of popular life and the ethical goodness often of of working people or people um, who are, you know, if in if you're in a Dickens novel and you want help, you ask the poor and they'll help you. Whereas, whereas in <laughs> whereas in Orwell, they'll probably vomit all over you. <laughs> One last question, which is the question that that ends each episode of the Ninety Nine Novels podcast: If you could add another book to Burgess's list of Ninety Nine Novels, which one would it be and why? Okay, uh, right. Of course, the list got quite long after a while. I started to think, oh, what's missing here? Um, and, you know, J.G. Farrell, you know, Troubles and Siege of Krishnapur, I think, would be runners. Samuel Beckett's trilogy, Malloy, Malone Dies, The Unnameable, you know, that would be on my list. John Berger's novel, G, I think, would be there. John Katzier's Life and Times, Michael Kay. Um, but, of course, the one thing that's so striking, I think, is, is there are relatively few women novelists on that. Um, no Rosamund Lehman, no Penelope Fitzgerald. I mean, Penelope Fitzgerald's offshore would be a strong contender, I think. Molly Keane's good behaviour would be a strong contender. Um, my favourite recent thing, although it's probably more short stories than a novel, is Eve Babbitt's Slow Days, Fast Company, which is wonderful. But I think having gone through all those possibles at one point, as I've been thinking about it, I think probably it would be Jean Reese's Wide Sargasso Sea, um, which is such. You know, it's 66 it comes out, but it, it seems still to be ahead of us, you know, so, uh, oh God, so richly anticipatory of so much that comes after in terms of thinking about, you know, fictionally, you know, formally innovative. It's, you know, it's interest in the, uh, you know, it's, it's thinking the post-colonial, you know, in in this most kind of deeply idiomatic way. Uh, it does seem to be an astonishingly kind of prescient novel, just out, out of nowhere, really, um, and, and still immensely rich. And so many, so many novelists have read 
Jane Eyre and, and being dominated by it or repeated it. And she radically uh, rethinks that absolutely canonical, you know, text in, in world literature from a, a t you can never read it in the same way again. So I think Jean Reese's Why I Stargast OC, I would finally plump for. Well, you've been so generous. You, I think you, you should have all of the novels you've mentioned uh, <laughs> as well. Um, okay, thank you very much. Th th thank you, John. That, that's been uh, fascinating and has really uh, opened up the, the book for, for me and I'm sure uh, other people listening. Thank you very much. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. You've been listening to 99 Novels, a podcast by the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. John Bowen's edition of 1984 is published by Oxford World's Classics and available from all good bookshops. The theme music is Anthony Burgess's Concerto for Flute, Strings and Piano in D minor and is performed by No Dice Collective. It can be found online at nodicecollective.com. For more information about Anthony Burgess and to find out how you can support the work of the Burgess Foundation, visit www.anthonyburgess.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.